Our little town does not lie on the frontier, nowhere near. It is so far from the frontier, in fact, that perhaps no one from our little town has ever been there. Desolate highlands have to be crossed, as well as wide, fertile plains. To imagine even part of the road makes one tired, and more than part, one just cannot imagine. There are also big towns on the road, each far larger than ours. Ten little towns like ours laid side by side, and ten more forced down from above, still would not produce one of those enormous, overcrowded towns. If one does not get lost on the way, one is bound to lose oneself in these towns, and to avoid them is impossible on account of their size. But what is even further from our town than the frontier, if such distances can be compared at all, it's like saying that a man of 300 years is older than one of 200. What is even further than the frontier is the capital. Whereas we do get news of the frontier wars now and again, of the capital we learn next to nothing. We civilians, that is. For of course, the government officials have very good connections with the capital. They can get news from there in as little as three months, so they claim at least. Now, it is remarkable, and I am continually being surprised at the way we in our town humbly submit to all orders issued in the capital. For centuries, no political change has been brought about by the citizens themselves. In the capital, great rulers have superseded each other. Indeed, even dynasties have been deposed or annihilated, and new ones have started. In the past century, even the capital itself was destroyed. A new one was founded far away from it. Later on, this too was destroyed and the old one rebuilt. Yet none of this had any influence on our little town. Our officials have always remained at their posts. The highest officials came from the capital, the less high from other towns, and the lowest from among ourselves. That is how it has always been, and it has suited us. The highest official is the chief tax collector. He has the rank of colonel and is known as such. The present one is an old man. I've known him for years because he was already a colonel when I was a child. At first, he rose very fast in his career, but then he seems to have advanced no further. Actually, for our little town, his rank is good enough. A higher rank would be out of place. When I try to recall him, I see him sitting on the veranda of his house in the market square, leaning back, pipe in mouth. Above him from the roof flutters the imperial flag. On the sides of the veranda, which is so big that minor military maneuvers are sometimes held there, washing hangs out to dry. His grandchildren, in beautiful silk clothes, play around him. They are not allowed down in the market square. The children there are considered unworthy of them. But the grandchildren are attracted by the square. So they thrust their heads between the posts of the banister, and when the children below begin to quarrel, they join the quarrel from above. This colonel, then, commands the town. I don't think he has ever produced a document entitling him to this position. Very likely, he does not possess such a thing. Maybe he really is chief tax collector. But is that all? Does that entitle him to rule over all the other departments in the administration as well? True, his office is very important for the government, but for the citizens, it is hardly the most important. One is almost under the impression that the people here say, now that you've taken all we possess, please take us as well. In reality, of course, it was not he who seized the power, nor is he a tyrant. It has just come about over the years that the chief tax collector is automatically the top official, and the colonel accepts the tradition just as we do. Yet, while he lives among us without laying too much stress on his official position, he is something quite different from the ordinary citizen. When a delegation comes to him with a request, he stands there like the wall of the world. Behind him is nothingness. One imagines hearing voices whispering in the background, but this is probably a delusion. After all, he represents the end of all things, at least for us. At these receptions, he really was worth seeing. Once, as a child, I was present when a delegation of citizens arrived to ask him for a government subsidy because the poorest quarter of the town had been burned to the ground. My father, the blacksmith, a man well respected in the community, was a member of the delegation and had taken me along. There's nothing exceptional about this. Everyone rushes to spectacles of this kind. One can hardly distinguish the actual delegation from the crowd. Since these receptions usually take place on the veranda, there are even people who climb up by ladder from the market square and take part in the goings-on from over the banister. On this occasion, 
about a quarter of the veranda had been reserved for the colonel. The crowd kept filling the rest of it. A few soldiers kept watch, some of them standing round him in a semicircle. Actually, a single soldier would have been quite enough, such as our fear of them. I don't know exactly where these soldiers come from. In any case, from a long way off. They all look very much alike. They wouldn't even need a uniform. They are small, not strong, but agile people. The most striking thing about them is the prominence of their teeth, which almost overcrowd their mouths, and a certain restless twitching of their small, narrow eyes. This makes them the terror of the children, but also their delight, for again and again, the children long to be frightened by these teeth, these eyes, so as to be able to run away in horror. Even grown-ups probably never quite lose this childish terror. At least it continues to have an effect. There are, of course, other factors contributing to it. The soldiers speak a dialect utterly incomprehensible to us, and they can hardly get used to ours, all of which produces a certain shut-off, unapproachable quality corresponding, as it happens, to their character, for they are silent, serious, and rigid. They don't actually do anything evil, and yet they are almost unbearable in an evil sense. A soldier, for example, enters a shop, buys some trifling object, and stays there, leaning against the counter. He listens to the conversations, probably does not understand them, and yet gives the impression of understanding. He himself does not say a word, just stares blankly at the speaker, then back at the listeners, all the while keeping his hand on the hilt of the long knife in his belt. This is revolting. One loses the desire to talk. The customers start leaving the shop. And only when it is quite empty does the soldier also leave. Thus, wherever the soldiers appear, our lively people grow silent. That's what happened this time, too. As on all solemn occasions, the colonel stood upright, holding in front of him two poles of bamboo in his outstretched hands. This is an ancient custom, implying more or less that he supports the law, and the law supports him. Now, everyone knows, of course, what to expect up on the veranda, and yet, each time, people take fright all over again. On this occasion, too, the man chosen to speak could not begin. He was already standing opposite the colonel when his courage failed him, and, muttering a few excuses, he pushed his way back into the crowd. No other suitable person willing to speak could be found, albeit several unsuitable ones offered themselves. A great commotion ensued, and messengers went in search of various citizens who were well-known speakers. During all this time, the colonel stood there, motionless, only his chest moving visibly up and down to his breathing. Not that he breathed with difficulty, it was just that he breathed so conspicuously, much as frogs breathe, except with them it is normal, while here it was exceptional. I squeezed myself through the grown-ups and watched him through a gap between two soldiers until one of them kicked me away with his knee. Meanwhile, the man originally chosen to speak had regained his composure and, firmly held up by two fellow citizens, was delivering his address. It was touching to see him smile throughout this solemn speech describing a grievous misfortune, a most humble smile which strove in vain to elicit some slight reaction on the colonel's face. Finally, he formulated the request. I think he was only asking for a year's tax exemption, but possibly also for timber from the imperial forests at a reduced price. Then he bowed low, as did everyone else except the colonel, the soldiers, and a number of officials in the background. To the child, it seemed ridiculous that the people on the ladders should climb down a few rungs so as not to be seen during the significant pause, and now and again peer inquisitively over the floor of the veranda. After this had lasted quite a while, an official, a little man, stepped up to the colonel and tried to reach the latter's height by standing on his toes. The colonel, still motionless save for his deep breathing, whispered something in his ear, whereupon the little man clapped his hands and everyone rose. The petition has been refused, he announced. You may go. An undeniable sense of relief passed through the crowd. Everyone surged out, hardly a soul paying any special attention to the colonel who, as it were, had turned once more into a human being like the rest of us. I still caught one last glimpse of him as he wearily let go of the poles which fell to the ground, then sank into an armchair produced by some officials and promptly put his pipe in his mouth. This whole occurrence is not isolated. It's in the general run of things. 
Indeed, it does happen now and again that minor petitions are granted, but then it invariably looks as though the colonel had done it as a powerful private person on his own responsibility, and it had to be kept all but a secret from the government. Not explicitly, of course, but that is what it feels like. No doubt, in our little town, the colonel's eyes, so far as we know, are also the eyes of the government, and yet there is a difference which it is impossible to comprehend completely. In all important matters, however, the citizens can always count on a refusal. And now the strange fact is that without this refusal, one simply cannot get along. Yet at the same time, these official occasions designed to receive the refusal are by no means a formality. Time after time, one goes there full of expectation and in all seriousness, and then one returns, if not exactly strengthened or happy, nevertheless not disappointed or tired. About these things, I do not have to ask the opinion of anyone else. I feel them in myself, as everyone does. Nor do I have any great desire to find out how these things are connected. As a matter of fact, there is, so far as my observations go, a certain age group that is not content. These are the young people, roughly between 17 and 20. Quite young fellows, in fact, who are utterly incapable of foreseeing the consequences of even the least significant, far less a revolutionary, idea. And it is among just them that discontent creeps in.